All right, so I'm a UNH student, I'm a senior, and I'm actually a triple major with sign language, French, and linguistics. Um, I'm also working towards a minor in Portuguese, not through UNH because UNH does, unfortunately doesn't offer Portuguese anymore. Um, but I, as you can tell, I just like, like learning languages. <laughs> That's, I don't know. That's kind of what drew me to linguistics. Um, and when I was trying to come up with uh, things to talk about and like reasons to share, like why I might do this or that or whatever, I kind of like in my head categorized it into like four kind of like types of uh, reasons. So the first being personal reasons, activities, networking, and opportunities. And how I envision it is like the top there is like more like individual stuff. And like as you go through each of these kind of things, like it gets more outward, outwardly expressed into like community, other, um, other countries, into your own future, in the, um, so that kind of thing. So like for me personally, the reason why I wanted to learn Portuguese was because my mom is Portuguese and I'm primarily Portuguese. She was born <laughs> over there. She just never had time to teach me as a kid for some reason. Um, so I had to specifically go out of my way to find like a location in order to learn it. Um, so here I have like heritage, so like that kind of reason might drive you to learn or pick one language over the other. Another major thing in my life is I love music um, and I don't restrict my music to just English. So I listen to songs in Portuguese and French, in German, um, other languages as well. So there might be like individual goals or individual interests you have that will drive like why you choose to learn a language or choose one language over another. And then activities, I'm kind of thinking like that's when you start participating in actual activities like in your own community, in your local community. So things like that do it exist. On the same kind of note as like the music, I have been to multiple concerts where the primary language spoken is not English. So I've seen Becky G, who's a, a Spanish artist, um, Angel, who's a French artist, and I have seen Blackpink, who's a Korean artist. Obviously, Korean's a different ballpark, but at least with the French and the Spanish music, I can like, I can understand more French than I do Spanish, but Portuguese and Spanish are like really close. So like I can pick out the general topic that we're talking about. Um, and then so I figured that was like one type of activity and there is a plethora more. So art exhibits is another one. Um, I am a museum goer, I like to go to museums. Um, specifically, I went to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts a couple years ago and they had an exhibit about late 19th century French artists. Um, and so even before I started learning languages, I was already interested in art, but then adding that extra layer of like, I understand the culture, I understand the history of where these paintings are coming from, really allows you to like appreciate that kind of thing more. Um, and even if you don't like art, you can have that same sort of appreciation towards another discipline that you have that interest in. Another one is clubs. So I've been a part of language clubs all throughout high school, all throughout college so far. Uh, I did go to Pingerton Academy. So it is there where I started learning French and sign language. Um, I was a part of their ASL club and I was a part of their French club. Actually, I take that back. They didn't have a French club, but they had like French extracurriculars that I participated in. Um, at UNH, there is a French club. I'm in that. There is an ASL club. There's two actually because ASL or UNH at Manchester and UNH in Durham have two separate ASL classes and two different ASL clubs. I learn ASL out of the Manchester campus uh, because it is like combined with interpreting as well. Um, and then, like I said earlier, unfortunately there is no Portuguese programs at UNH, but I do learn Portuguese through UMass Lowell and they have a Portuguese club over there that they're trying to get back up on the ground again because like COVID kind of like shut up like all of that down. So I'm actively trying to help them get it off the ground. Another one is volunteer work. So specifically with French Club, there is the Franco-American Center and every year they have Poutine Fest. Um, so I go there, I volunteer my time. Uh, you have the option to like help them set up the day. You can go like during the actual event and help like that period of time. 
you get free poutine, which if you don't know what that is, it's like french fries, gravy, and cheese curds, and it's like traditionally Canadian, fr like French Canadian, it's really good. <laughs> Another example I have here is like general hobbies, um, and that can, and like hobbies, going back to the other point, like can be individual or it can be community based, so it just depends on the hobby. Uh, the one I included here was cooking, because recently I've been trying to learn how to cook more types of food from other cultures than like the American culture, specifically my Portuguese. So I included some pictures here of just some of the food that I've... This isn't the food I made, because I, I didn't take pictures of what I made, but it's pictures of the type of food I made. So in the corner, it's um, pastel de bacalhau, which is like a salt cod potato fritter. Um, the one over to that, like that yellowy soupy thing is um, Musta Maracujá, so it's like a passion fruit mousse pudding thing. Then down here is Pashtai de Nata, which is like probably the most famous pastry in the Lusophone world. Um, <laughs> it's just like a, a custard tart almost. Uh, all of them are really good. And then I baked cookies for ASL Club one time with little hand shapes on them. Um, and then another one is just like local community spots. So also in Lowell, I know there's like a large like Portuguese population and they do have a Portuguese market that I go to occasionally. Another example for French is that in Wyndham there is Le Macaron, which is a pastry, like a French pastry place, primarily selling macarons. And not only did I go because I enjoy the food, but I got to know the owner of that place really well because I speak French and she speaks French. So when I go, like I'll order in French and we'll talk a little bit. Um, she's not a native learner herself. She, I think it's like from Austria, moved to Belgium, learned French in Belgium, finally moved here like years later. Um, so I know she knows like a lot more languages than I do. So, um, but having the knowledge that I do about French language and French culture, uh, provided me like to have that relationship because like that wouldn't have happened if I wasn't. And specifically, networking is also really big because, um, like like I says here, like meeting like through language learning, like you're gonna meet people that like you never would have met before, and it's such an interesting thing to think about. And I included a bunch of people who um, I've met and hung out with over the years most of which I still keep in contact with, at least online, and then some of which I still see in person. Um, this is like one of my best friends. Uh, we both do sign language together. Um, this was my class in Portugal this past summer when I studied abroad there in Lisbon. Um, that, like, this is the group that like, if I see anyone out of all of these people, it's primarily in someone in this picture. Um, these two people, girl in blue and this other girl, they were also in Portugal with me. They just weren't necessarily part of our class, but the program that I went with had like multiple courses to take. They just, so they weren't in this specific one, but they were there. And like, we still, like, we still chat online, but like they live in Albany, New York. So like, I never would have met these people if it weren't for my opportunities that I have taken because of my language learning. Um, I met, uh, when I went to the Korean concert, I met these wonderful ladies from a variety of Asian backgrounds. So again, like having those connections. And what's funny is one of the girls are also from France. She moved to America to like help like teach English. So then it was like a trifecta of English, Korean, and French. Um, this is the same sort of thing. It's um, our class again. These two, or these three, I should say, are from when I studied abroad in France in high school. Um, yeah, same sort of deal class and then like mainly the person I hung out with and I'm friends with Facebook I'm friends on Facebook with her she was um, one of the program like leaders so she does like a lot of student traveling for colleges high schools etc um, this so I went to Portugal for like a whole month I only went to France for about like two and a half weeks I was going to go again but then COVID happened so then I didn't go <laughs> Um, I've also been to Canada like several times. Uh, I know Quebec fairly well. Um, and then lastly, I feel like the real meat of it is the opportunity section, which covers like a lot. 
in terms of like travel opportunities, uh, gaining experience and things that again you never would have done before if it weren't for language learning. Going into the, uh, the professional world, it can help you job-wise and career-wise. It can help you develop professional skills and it can also help you develop personal skills that you'll take with you for the rest of your life. So here I included a bunch of the pictures I, take, I took when I went to Canada. Um, I've been there, like I said, multiple times. There's like new Quebec and old Quebec. I like know my way around. Like I know like the good spots to eat, the bad spots to eat. Um, I could go into a whole like long tangent of like what it means to be a local and like cultural awareness and all of that. Um, but it's just really funny, fun. And then also I went dog sledding. Like again, who goes dog sledding? Like um, tubing. Like just these fun experiences. Um, this was just a little bit limited though because like whenever I go it's only for like a short period of time because like it's relatively close. Relatively. Um, however, when I went to France, that's obviously a lot, a lot farther away. <laughs> and I went there for two and a half weeks. But even still, that two and a half week period helped me more in French that like, I feel like I can express. Because I feel like it's cliche at this point, but like being surrounded in your target language, surrounded by your target culture, that true immersion helps, like beyond anything that you can actually think. And like, it sounds like, oh, like I'm just reading from a textbook, you know, or like, oh, like that's something like my teacher would tell me all the time. But it's like, until you actually do it, um, you don't like, it really is like life-changing. It helps in so many ways. Um, and like, for example, just from this two and a half weeks alone, the next four months of my French lessons here, completely useless because I already learned it in this two and a half weeks. I, I literally got back and like, the things that my teacher was teaching to the rest of the class, I, I already knew. Um, I also got to see Notre Dame before it burnt down, so like, I guess that's cool. These two are technically Monaco, different country with like royalty. The Louvre, I'm sure we all know Mona Lisa. So again, um, there are, and I'll go into this more in detail with like the next slide because it's better a uh, comparison, but like language gives you access to the culture and then there's also multiple aspects of the culture. Um, there are like these big things that like when you think of a culture automatically come to mind like Eiffel Tower, Mona Lisa. So it's like, yes, those things are cool and I definitely like still recommend them. But also when you are fully immersed like that, especially if you do like a homestay, which um, for a period of time I was staying with this like nice French old lady. Um, that also gives you like real hands on, on the ground, like daily exposure to that language and that culture. Um, and like just all of this, you don't get in a textbook. <laughs> and you don't get most of this in a classroom either. Um, part of the reason um, why I stayed uh, with the French old lady was because I went to an international uh, school there for some days. Um, so I had people from Switzerland, England, and Estonia in my class. Again, I'm still friends with some of, like online with a couple of my classmates from Estonia and Switzerland. And then in my homestay, I had an Italian roommate who was from Italy, who I also still keep in somewhat touch with online. Um, so it's, it's just experiences, like life-changing experiences. And it's even more so when you go for like longer periods of time, which kind of like makes sense. So like I was in Portugal for an entire month and the amount that that improves my Portuguese skills, my po Portuguese like knowledge about the culture and the history and all of that is just like, I am like forever grateful. Um, I went in June, so it's like that's a big party month because it's like All Saints month or something. I think that would be like the translation. Um, we went, like I gained a better understanding of religious, like religions because I'm personally am not super religious, but obviously like a lot of countries, including Portugal are. And I went to like Fatima. Um, and so again, just um, I was able to get a better understanding and a better awareness of these sort of things. Some of the people in this program were also Mormons, which also 
was eye-opening because like again you just meet all these people and you get exposure to people from all these different backgrounds all these different lived experiences for a multitude of reasons um i got to visit like the place that my mother was born um just life-changing and then <laughs> On the other end of it, the professional wise, we already touched upon it multiple times, but like at the core of learning languages is like communication. And like having good communication skills when you are at a job is like everything. And not only will you will you develop good communication skills, but you will have those communication skills that work monolingually monolingually in English cross-lingually in multiple languages, uh, communication between different cultures and people with different cultures coming from different backgrounds. And you sh uh, can really like market yourself and like you should be able to like know your work and what you bring to the table. And as someone who has not as much ex work experience as some of the people in the room, but I do have a little bit of experience that not everyone you work with is going to have that same level of communication skills that you do. So it, it, it might not seem like a big thing, but it really is. Um, and then obviously there's the pay aspect. It's a resume builder. Um, especially if you do like, um, like a dual degree option, not only is it a resume builder to know another language and be able to understand another culture, but it's also a resume builder in the sense that like it, it is more work, you earn more credits, you earn, you do all this extra stuff that not everyone does. And that also uh, shows to employers on your resume that like you can handle like a good workload and you have good work ethic um, and that you, like you can have goals and achieve them. So yeah. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've actually got two, two questions, if I may. Um, so you're doing a triple major. How long does one have to stay in? So it's obviously not a four-year stint. It's, how long is that? Um, I take a shitload of classes every okay. semester. Yep. So for me, I'm only staying five years. Oh. Um, but that's with taking like an average of like 20 credits a semester, which is a lot of work. In the um, summer, too? You work during the summertime? I don't. Okay. Um, I only studied abroad just like this one summer because um, that was the program I went with. Um, I'm currently looking into more um, abroad things that are happening like next summer. Um, I'm looking to like even, there's a, a volunteer opportunity I have to use to help a deaf school in Jamaica, with, in Jamaican Sign Language. But financially, we'll see what I can do. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, if you were taking the average load of classes, it might take you a little longer than five years, but I wouldn't say more than six. Okay. And the other question I had, too, is um, it's not uncommon to see people who major in more than one spoken language, but what, what drew you to sign language? I find that fascinating. I get asked this question all the time, even by deaf people, because a lot of people who take sign language have, like, some sob, some like, the, yeah, yeah, like, some sob story of, like, oh, like, my brother's deaf, and, like, or they have, like, some sort of in- but for me, it kind of just happened. Because um, since it was a class offered at Pinkerton, my high school, me and my best friend at the time took it together because we figured it would be an easy A. Um, but I really fell in love with like the language and like the people using it, the deaf people I've met in my life. They've really helped me become who I am today for multiple reasons. Um, and then I graduated 2020. We know that was not a good year. <laughs> um, and I had a, I, was going on from high school into college, and I was like, I don't know what to pick for like a major, so I just stuck with sign language, and then I added on stuff <laughs> after. Very cool. Thank you. Any other questions? 